Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. It's your friendly narrator, Sue, here. And I just like to say, when I was younger, my favorite times would be when my family would gather together. I would go and play with my cousins while the adults sat and talked. But once it started getting dark out, something magical happened. We lit candles and everybody came together the children, the adults, the elders, and we began to share in that candlelight our stories, stories of the paranormal, scary things that had happened to us, family lore, encounters with monsters, all sorts of spooky things. And these were my favorite times as a kid. So allow me to light the candles and invite you wherever you may be into my living room for the next hour, your family. So please, sit, listen, enjoy. Grab a snack, grab a drink, get cozy. As I share with you some terrifying stories, some heartwarming encounters, but most of all, every tale I tell is thought-provoking. Here we indulge in tales of Bigfoot, Dogman, and a whole host of other paranormal entities. So get cozy, cuz here we go. It was September 30th, 2013, and I found myself driving along Route 109, halfway between Hokim and Ocean Shores in Washington. I had just finished my visit to Hokim and was heading back to my home in Ocean Shores when an unexpected encounter would forever etch itself into my memory. As I continued along the road, a deer suddenly darted across heading south, about an eighth of a mile ahead of me. Being familiar with the behavior of these creatures, I knew that where there was one deer, there was often another close behind it. I instinctively slowed down, exercising caution. However, what appeared next left me completely dumbfounded. Instead of a second deer, an entirely different figure emerged from the edge of the wood. This figure, a male being, sprinted across the road with astonishing speed, covering the distance in just three strides. I was taken aback, my mind racing to comprehend what I was witnessing. I brought my vehicle to a complete stop, utterly shocked by the surreal sight before me. This enigmatic being reached the top of the roadside berm and turned to face me. In that moment, our eyes locked and a rush of unsettling emotions coursed through me. His grin was unmistakably menacing, leaving me with an undeniable sense of threat. Without further hesitation, he pivoted back around and vanished into the dense brush that lined the roadside. I had just encountered a Sasquatch, up close and personal. The encounter was so intimate that I could have reached out and touched him as my car window was rolled down, placing me no more than 20 feet away. His facial features were remarkably human-like, except for the absence of a chin and a protruding brow ridge. His nose, though, human in shape, possessed a slightly European appearance. Piercing black eyes met my gaze, while his skin and hair exhibited shades of gray. The remnants of his teeth, he revealed, were akin to those of a human, albeit in a severely deteriorated condition. It was clear that oral hygiene was not a priority for him. Observing his movements, provided further insight into his uniqueness. When he ran, his palms faced downward, unlike our upright thumbs-up position. And when he stood upright, his palms were oriented backward, in contrast to the forward-facing thumbs of a human. Additionally, his arms appeared slightly longer than those of a typical human, though not excessively so, merely a half a hand's length beyond what one might expect as the encounter unfolded. During midday, with the sun casting its rays from the south, 
I could discern the shape of his head through the hair, although the hair rose significantly, giving the impression of a pointed head. The underlying structure was undeniably human. Roughly estimated his height, I would venture to say he stood between seven and eight feet tall. Unfortunately, the encounter transpired too swiftly for me to capture photographic evidence. It was a fleeting moment, but one that would forever remain valid in my mind. Furthermore, there were additional peculiarities that caught my attention. As previously mentioned, his hands turned inward, more than a human's, and his arms exhibited a slight elongation. The face, nose, and teeth resembled those of a human, while the absence of a chin further distinguished his appearance. These details served to further cement the profound uniqueness of this remarkable being. Since that fateful day, I have replayed the encounter countless times in my mind, attempting to reconcile the disbelief and awe that gripped me. It was a remarkable experience, one that defied conventional explanations and expanded my understanding of the world around me. Thank you for allowing me to share. On to the next one. When I was a boy, seven to be exact, my mother and I lived with my grandfather, who had a farmhouse in a rural location in southwestern Pennsylvania. My grandfather was a handyman who also worked a small blacksmith shop in his old barn. My grandmother had died before I was born, and my father had also passed away while in the army, serving overseas in Vietnam. Beginning in the summer of 1974, we noticed strange howling sounds coming from the woods that surrounded the property. The activity came at night and was very frightening when the howling came close. The sounds didn't seem to bother my grandfather, though my mother and I were shaken when it would begin. The sounds continued off and on for about a year, but we never noticed any animals. My grandfather and I would hunt for deer and squirrels in the woods during the colder months but we never saw signs of unusual animal activity, and my grandfather never mentioned the howls, nor did he pay much attention to them. One late afternoon in the spring of 1975, I was helping my grandfather in his shop when I noticed something moving around the edge of the woods near an area my grandfather kept some old junk cars and other items. It was about 200 feet from our location, but I clearly noticed someone or something moving around. I told my grandfather to look. He walked to the door, lit his pipe, and said nothing. After a minute or two, he turned around and got back to work. About that time, this thing moved into the woods and disappeared. I couldn't judge how big it was, but it just reminded me of a magazine picture I had seen of a large ape that was said to inhabit the Asian jungles. Later that evening, I told my mother what I had seen. She was shocked because she knew I wouldn't lie to her and that the howling sounds had been closer lately. I also told her of my grandfather's response when I pointed the creature out to him. She immediately stood up and walked into the sitting room in order to ask my grandfather what it was. He started to shake his head slowly and said he was hoping that we wouldn't see it because he was worried we would be scared and leave him. After assuring him that we'd never leave him, my mother again insisted that he tell us what this creature was. He looked away, took a deep breath and said, it's a dark walker and he said that it had lived in the woods for many years. He said the Native Americans called it a stone spirit, and they thought it was an evil spirit who would appear when someone was about to die. The last time he had seen the Dark Walker was the night before my grandmother died. My mother was skeptical of the harbinger of death angle, but sensed that there was something unnatural nearby. 
The howling continued each night, though we hadn't seen any signs of the dark walker. One warm evening, we were sitting on the back porch. There were a few howls, but it seemed like the sounds were further away. We were listening to the radio, when all at once, my grandfather stood up and looked out toward the barn. He turned to me and said, Billy, go get my pistol and ammo. Hurry now. I ran into the sitting room and grabbed his Smith and Wesson 357 Magnum revolver and a handful of bullets from the old steamer trunk. I handed them to him and watched him load the gun. He then picked up a hatchet and slid it into his pants belt. Now both of you get into the house now. We were in the kitchen, looking through the screen door, and watched as my grandfather walked slowly toward the barn. We saw him turn and walk out of sight into the dark. I decided to grab my Winchester Model 42 410 shotgun and keep it nearby. After a minute or so, we heard three gunshots and a blood-curdling scream emanate from the woods near the barn. Then, it suddenly stopped, and there was complete silence. We were frozen and wondering if we should go look for my grandfather. A few seconds later, we heard him yell, Stay in the house until I come back. I heard the pickup truck start up. I looked out the storage room window and saw my grandfather drive to the back of the barn and park. Several minutes later, he backed up and drove by the side of the house out onto the road. I could see that there was something in the back, covered up with a tarp. It was getting late, so my mother told me to go to bed. The next morning, I came downstairs and sat beside my grandfather, who was reading the newspaper and drinking a cup of coffee. My mother was sitting at the other end of the table, staring at my grandfather. Not long after that, she said, Well, Dad, tell him. My grandfather put the paper down and looked at me. I killed the dark walker. That was all he said. My mother told me not to tell anyone, and the matter was closed. We never talked about it again. My grandfather lived another 15 years, and my mother stayed with him until his dying day. When I grew older, I moved away and raised a family. I would return home to visit each summer and never heard another howl since. On to the next one. In Adir County, Oklahoma, Thelma West said she put out some stinky garbage when she and another man saw a creature on the porch eating it. The creature had big red eyes, when on all fours was about five feet high, the man shot at it with a shotgun, and it ran quickly into the woods. In Adir County in Oklahoma, Brian Jones and two Richie boys saw red eyes looking in at a window. Outside, Brian met a foul-smelling eight-foot-tall Bigfoot, which lifted him off the ground, then dropped him and ran off when other people appeared. The witnesses shot at the Bigfoot who retaliated by throwing rocks at them. There had been frequent sightings in the area in the previous few years. On to the next one. In Delaware County in Oklahoma, one evening in September, my friend and I were sitting at Jumper Cemetery, about dark on a full moon night. As we were sitting there, I heard the sound that I thought was a deer walking down the ridge. I told my friend, listen, there's a deer coming down the hill. We sat there and listened as the sound made its way down the ridge from town. The west side of the cemetery has trees grown up along the fence row for about half the distance of the west side. A little further down is a platform between two huge oak trees used to place food on when they are having funerals. The sound came to the bottom of the holler on the west side of the cemetery. The cemetery is enclosed by a hog wire barbed wire fence about four feet tall. Then the sound proceeded to come up the hill between the trees along the fence row and the platform for food. As we listened to the sound 
come towards us, we were incredulous as we saw a large, hairy man-looking thing walk up to the fence and step over it. We watched as the animal walked across the cemetery toward a huge tree in the middle. As it came under this tree, its head was just below its lowest branch. Apparently, at this time, it became aware of us as it turned its head and looked over its right shoulder at us. When it saw us, it didn't run, but it began to walk very fast toward the southern border of the cemetery. When it got there, it again stepped over the fence. When it got to the timber, it crashed through the trees, making a terrible racket. I looked at my friend and asked him if he saw what I had. He replied that he thought that he had. I'd never mentioned this to anyone for fear of being ridiculed, because not only did we see what we thought to be a Bigfoot, but the one that we saw was white. Some ten years later, I was teaching it at Kenwood, located in the extreme western portion of central Delaware County. We were watching a video called Legends of the Ozark. This video recreated a scene that supposedly happened near Fayetteville, Arkansas. This recreation showed exactly what my friend and I had seen. Thereafter, I spoke about this incident to some of my elderly friends and relatives who have lived in the area all their lives. Some of them also admitted to having seen this beast at some point in the past, but like me, had never said anything due to the fear of being ridiculed. I know what I saw. It doesn't matter if I'm believed or not. I myself was incredulous at the time. My mind had a hard time accepting what my eyes were seeing. I can see this in my mind today, just as if it had happened moments ago. The smell was terrible, and the animal was white. It looked like the recreation on Legend of the Ozark. This was in early evening, between 8 and 9 p.m., on a bright, moonlit night. On to the next one. In Latimer County in Oklahoma, it was dark, about 8 p.m. My two sons and I were watching television while eating popcorn. The eldest, age 16, was sitting across the room on the love seat. The youngest, age 8, was sitting next to me on the sofa. We were sharing a bowl of popcorn placed between us. I smelled this horrific stench coming from the window directly behind us. My family has teased me about having the nose of a hound. So, my 16-year-old says, Oh, Mom, you're always smelling something. Well, I look around and the smell dissipates. We continue watching television. A few minutes pass, the stench blows in again. I got up while telling my oldest son to help me pull out the sofa that there is something horrible under it. As he approached, he smells the stench and says it's a snake. The youngest moves back. We pulled the couch out and looked over the entire room and came up with nothing. We noticed the breeze blowing the curtains and decided that whatever the source, it's outside and we'll check it out in the daylight. The 16-year-old went outside about an hour later. He came back inside for the shotgun. His dad has taken him hunting since he was six years old. He knows guns and the woods. He said someone was standing in the back about six yards north of the house by a railroad tie post watching the house, and it was one darn big guy. He took the gun and went toward our chicken pen. I heard him yell from about 50 yards or so from our chicken pen to call the law. I was scared beyond measure for my son, not knowing what was happening. I called the sheriff after about 10 minutes. My son came back to the house. He said the guy stepped over a barbed wire fence and jumped over a brush pile while leaving. He'd not had to use the gun. Two sheriff deputies arrived. They shined light up and down the yard and property and found nothing. My son went to his grandmother's house to inform her that we had a prowler. She lived about 40 yards northeast of us. He'd been gone about 20 minutes when I heard the metal latch of an outside storage building. Someone had gone into the building. Now, my youngest son and I were in the house. The eldest, knowing I was already spooked, would not be lurking about. His dad was out of town, working, putting up a gas rig, the question being who had opened the latch. 
The building is my laundry room and contained my washer, dryer, and deep freeze. I phoned my mother-in-law and asked to speak to my son. When he answered the phone, I'd ask if he'd been there the whole time. The answer being yes. I told him someone had entered the laundry building and, to my knowledge, hadn't left. He said he would be home. After telling him to be careful, I waited and watched. He was home in two minutes. While we were discussing what to do, he yelled out, What in the bleep is that? My eight-year-old ran into the kitchen. They both had seen a face in the picture window behind the sofa. The eldest said it was hairy and dirty. I called the sheriff again. My son got the shotgun, and my youngest son and myself waited behind him, sitting on the floor with the lights out. I fully expected some deranged vagabond to jump through the window. While waiting, we smelled the stench again, as we were only three or four feet from the window. Then I knew the scent was coming from this person. Knowing this sent chills up my spine. The deputies arrived again and found nothing and left. I never associated this event with the Bigfoot until reading about other incidents. The stench is what ties it in for me, and the description my son gave of the face in the window. The way this character acted just wasn't in keeping with anything I've ever known. But the deciding factor for me was about eight months ago. I repeated the story to a friend of ours, a retired Oklahoma Highway Patrolman who hunts with my husband. He said this was out of character for any perp he'd ever seen. As close as I can describe it, the scent was a mix between dirty, wet, steamy blue jeans, soiled diapers, and wet, filthy dog. That's why, for years, I thought we'd had a deranged or drugged-up tramp lurking about. My husband had found the signs of someone being in the woods roundabout. While returning from the chicken's pen one evening, I felt the hair stand up on the back of my neck. I knew someone or something was there. I made myself appear casually walking back to the house. I shut the door and locked it. Another time, the doorknob was turned and would have opened were it not locked. I and the neighbors heard strange screams and howls on occasion. My oldest son, who is now 38, was watching television across the room and left my location. My youngest son, who would be 30, died three years ago, and myself were eating popcorn while watching television, sitting in front of the eight-foot-wide picture windows containing the side-screened windows which were open. Perfect temperature, about 72 degrees. A slight breeze from the north. The time was around 8 p.m. Blackjack, hickory, cedar trees, lots of brush. There's a creek that flows about a quarter mile from our property. There's a pond about a hundred yards from our house. My grandson said he and a cousin have seen a Bigfoot about 13 miles east of us. On to the next one. In one humorous anecdote, Bob Strain was on an investigation in south-central United States with the North American Wood Ape Conservancy when he experienced Bigfoot disguised as logs. During his search, Strain peered inside a thicket but noticed nothing remarkable, save a few large logs on the ground. The following day, investigators could not find the logs. It is our belief that the logs were actually apes that were prone, that were lying there pretending to be logs, said Brian Brown of the North American Wood Ape Conservancy. We have a slogan, shoot all the logs, he joked. Stopping and freezing and pretending to be a tree, not moving, is something that has been observed time and time again. Sasquatch mistaken for trees are found in a plethora of reports. In 1963 in Washington, Paul Manley and two passengers driving through Dadis Pass see a tall, hairy tree stump step out from a ditch as their car passes. In 1983, Washington, four girls and one boy are playing jump rope when one of them spots a tall, black thing on two legs jumping across the creek. The primary witness notices a black stump under a tree. 
which I could not recall being there before. I kept looking at it thinking, is that a stump or something else? The shape looked like a tall black figure standing upright, leaning forward, with very long arms down to its knees. The head was turned, looking directly at us. However, it was so still, I thought it had to be a burnt stump. When the children scream, the figure flees. In 1999, Colorado, a youth leader at a Bible camp near Grand Junction is playing with his students one evening when he sees a Bigfoot emerge from the bushes. Hearing the children's voices, the creature spins and crouches, appearing identical to a large stump. It remains in position until the children leave, then continues on its way. 2018, Kentucky a couple driving near Sandy Hook see a tall figure, the color of a tree, standing by the road. It crossed the road in a few steps. The witness describes it as a walking tree. Some contend Sasquatch grow algae or moth on their coat, further enhancing their vegetal appearance. While possible from a biological standpoint, sloth fur can house a wide variety of organisms, ranging from moths, beetles, and cockroaches to fungi and algae. It also finds precedent in folklore. Some Nordic giants from the harshest climactic zones sprouted bushes and trees in their body for additional protection and camouflage, wrote Sarah Teal. Camouflage giants could have hours of fun with the unwary. There are a few more disconcerting discoveries than to find oneself astride a giant big toe or kneeling on his upper lip, peering up his nose. Bigfoot do not literally turn into logs, according to most reports. One exception comes from a Washington witness who allegedly spotted a large, hairy hominid outside her home. As she approached the creature, it abruptly walked a short distance into the woods, lay down on the ground, and, in full view, turned into a log. The witness allegedly dragged the log back into her home, where she used it as a coffee table for years. This is easily one of the most unbelievable stories ever recorded. It is certainly true Bigfoot's fur could make them difficult to see in the wild. After all, witnesses commonly compared the creature's coat to a ghillie suit, the shaggy outfit used by special forces to obscure the human form. Bernadette related a story from the late 19th century where a girl watched a Bigfoot lie next to a pile of debris and deliberately cover itself with detritus, twigs, leaves, dirt, to conceal itself from hunters. Nature might have designed Bigfoot's long, shaggy hair to serve a similar purpose to the ghillie suit, he wrote with Riggs. Indeed, a good-sized man wearing a ghillie suit seen from even a short distance in heavy woods bears a striking resemblance to a hominid with long, shaggy hair. Perhaps the most peculiar shape-shifting story was collected by ufologist Don Worley, a hitchhiker traveling through Texas in November 1964, was down on his luck and began walking along the highway. After a time, he heard movement from the brush and saw three glowing red orbs in the sky. The lights were dispelled momentarily by a passing car, but shortly returned and the sound of movement escalated. Unnerved, the witness turned to walk in the opposite direction, but was confronted by eight tall, dark, simian figures with glowing yellow eyes blocking the road. They followed the witness as he backed away slowly, fading out as cars approached and rematerializing once they passed. He kept an eye on the beasts for around half an hour, until a motorist finally stopped. As the witness entered the car, the apparition changed. A large glowing red ball of light began to turn black in places, and there formed an off pattern of luminous black lines on its surface or near its surface from within. Wrote Albert Rosales, who collected the encounter for his humanoid database. These black lines began to rotate clockwise 
slowly at first, and the longer he looked at them, the faster they got. They had a strong hypnotic effect on the witness. He felt an odd sensation of pressure between his eyes, and his glasses began to fog. The driver who said the witness was cold to the touch had also spotted the red spheres and tall ape-like creatures. They were able to join their bodies together in twos, fours, or all eight, and then separate, and apparently lacked hands and feet. The creatures, however, were never overtly hostile throughout the encounter. On to the next one. This happened in Kitsap County in Washington. This was near South Kingston. My boss and I work in forestry, and we're in the field almost every day. We were working in this remote part of an Indian reservation forested allotment. We were resurveying property lines and getting ready for a timber harvest. Well, this day, we were resurveying the south side of this allotment heading east. We were measuring every 100 feet for a distance of 1,320 feet. At approximately 11 a.m., we kept hearing something following us, either behind us or our left or right. It stayed approximately 100 to 250 feet away from us. There was this stench, real heavy odor that we kept smelling near us. I kept blaming my boss that he had crapped in his pants, and he kept accusing me of doing the same. He said there's only two of us out here, and I know I didn't do it. Well, anyway, we were taking a break from hacking through the brush with our machetes, and we were leaning against this 200-plus old-growth blow-down fir tree. I took a cigarette out and lit up, and then there was this branch or twig breaking like something large walking through the underbrush about 120 feet away. I could not find any rocks to throw in that direction, but found a U-shaped piece of wood that I threw near the spot where we heard the sound. It got quiet, and it was cloudy and kind of dark under the tree canopy. The noise came from the other side of a large salmonberry bush. Then, all of a sudden, the clouds broke open and allowed some daylight through behind the bushes about ten feet or so, so that the four creatures that were watching us, you could see their shadow. I told my boss, Mike, to take a look in that direction, but because of his bad eyesight, he could not see that well. There were two really big adult males and one skinny, tall female with shoulder-length hair, and she had a bad hump on her back. Her breasts were like a really old woman, and she kept wringing her hands together as she was speaking to the other males. There was a child to her left that stood about six feet tall, but was dwarfed by the three larger adult creatures. The two males stood motionless. They watched me and did not talk much to the female that was doing most of the talking in her own dialect. The males seemed to motion to her to keep quiet. Then the clouds covered up the rays of light and it got dark again. My boss, Mike, kinda had seen the shadows, but tried to convince me it was his boss, Ken, and some secretaries that he brought out into the woods that sometimes he does. Right after that, they kept following us, and my boss Mike got spooked and said, let's get out of here and come back next week to finish our survey. The animals were almost eight feet tall, except for the child, which was six feet tall. They were covered in fur or hair, except for around their eyes and nose and part of their cheeks. One thing I did notice was I did not see any ears on their head, the two large males were really huge, with large, broad shoulders. The female was tall and thin with a large hump on her back between her shoulder blade. Her breasts sagged near her waist. They spoke in a strange dialect that sounded like Salish tribal language, except for when they started to panic. They sounded like monkey or ape-type sounds. Whistles, stomping, lots of branches and trees snapping in half. One time, I heard a loud, bog-type howl and pounding on what sounded like a tree. It was between 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. Hot, humid, overcast, cloudy with sunbreaks, swamp, and numerous small creeks 
that empty into Puget Sound, which is approximately one mile south. Wooded second growth and old growth trees of Douglas fir. There is approximately 900 plus acres in this area with farmhouses and residential homes surrounded by forested areas. On to the next one. We live in the town of Toroella de Moncri, five kilometers from the Costa Brava coastline, where we also own and run a successful cafe bar. The population of our town is only about 11,000 people, but doubles during the summer period. For a short vacation, I plan to hire a new motorhome and escape to the country as a way for us to disconnect from our very busy lives. We only have the option to go for three days and two nights due to the kids' schooling, so I made the plan for a weekend break this October. The new Ford motorhome was hired locally, and we set off early Friday morning. I reserved a spot at a rural campsite. For the Friday and Saturday night, these campsites only open on the weekends during this time of year. I didn't want to travel too far due to our very short time frame. The campsite, El Pont, is located near to the Pantano de Sao, which is one hour and 30 minute drive from our hometown. None of us had been to this place before. It is inland from the coast away from the busy tourism of Costa Brava, and actually feels like another country. The landscape is comprised of dense forests, mountains, and, of course, the stunning lakes and reservoir Panto de Sao. Friday was spent mostly setting up camp. The motorhome offered the luxury us townies require, but the rural campsite gave me the much-needed escape I desired after such a busy summer. Our rule was no tech, so apart from Jane, we all left our smartphones and tablets at home. This was to be a very much back to the basics mini break. Jane unfortunately had to take her technology as she also manages rental villas back home. I have to say, we all loved the place. The campsite grounds, although small in terms of the size of the individual camping plots, actually spread across 10 hectares of dense forest, crystal clear streams, waterfalls, rock pools, and even featured a stunning Roman bridge. Friday was a great day. The next day, Saturday, the day of our encounter, started with a lazy breakfast and a pleasant dog walk. We set off mid-morning in the motorhome. The journey to the reservoir consisted of maneuvering the Ford Beast around single lane forest road. During this 40-minute drive, we saw numerous tin plate signs hanging from trees warning us about active hunters. This is the law here. I hadn't realized, but we were slap bang in the middle of the wild boar hunting season. Now, these beasts are extremely common here and are called pork sanglas. In the local Catalan dialect, these beasts can grow to huge sizes and can be extremely dangerous if they are in family groups. The large males and females are extremely strong, fast, and will attack to defend their offspring. Whilst driving, I mentioned to Eric that we'd be hearing gunshots throughout the day. Later, I also had a quiet but very important chat with Jane. The hunters had their four-wheel drive parked throughout the forest, and I saw several men dressed in their obligatory high-visibility clothing, with shotguns and several hunting dogs. We eventually arrived at the reservoir and found a good enough spot to park the motorhome for the day. Our happy little family of four, plus the two dogs, set off with our packed lunches, tools, and everything else we thought we'd need for the day by the lake. At this time, I warned Jane that if by chance we should come across any startled wild boar, we had to lift up our dogs and stand dead still. 
This was to signal that we posed no threat to them and, in theory, meant we'd be left alone. But I was still slightly concerned. After a decent hike, we managed to escape the typical Saturday tourist walkers and fishermen. I insisted we continue on a bit further, and it was certainly worth the extra hike. We came across an idyllic location by the lakeside that would serve as the perfect base camp for the day. It was completely away from man or beast, or at least so I thought. Now, I must explain the overwhelming beauty of this place. It has sheer rock faces, dense forest, very red earth, and crystal clear water. In the middle of the lake, there is an ancient village, and a church lies submerged beneath the water. During hot summers, when the water level is down, the village can be seen from the shore. It's a relatively popular tourist location, as the lake offers a chance to swim, cool off, and there are also kayaks for hire. In the off-season, the reservoir is very full, and the area is quiet, which is exactly why I chose to come at this time of year. Our wonderful Saturday was spent playing catch with our dogs, dipping our feet in the cool lake water, eating, drinking, and generally lazing in the warm afternoon sun. Temperatures were good. It was a stunning, idyllic day. The kids enjoyed whittling wood and making spears with two pocket knives I brought along for just that purpose. I made a small fire by the lake edge, more for the effect rather than heat, which certainly wasn't needed on such a stunning day. However, I did notice that I hadn't heard a single shotgun go off, nor had we heard any hunting dogs bark. In fact, we didn't see or hear another person or animal till around 4 p.m. I was stretched out on the red earth, enjoying the afternoon sun. The kids were with the dogs by the water's edge, and Jane was answering a rental client's question via WhatsApp when she alerted me to the animal taking a drink from the water. I turned to look and tried to focus on the thing by the water's edge. It was easily 100 to 150 meters further around the bank of the lake. This is very rocky and backs up to the edge of the forest. I couldn't make out what I was seeing, but all I could tell was that it was hairy and reddish in color. My first thought was that it somewhat resembled a long-haired cow native to the highlands of Scotland, but certainly not rural Catalonia. This thought instantly vanished when I watched a very human-like arm scoop up fresh water, lake to mouth, time and time again. I could make out a huge mangy body of fur a high forehead, huge shoulders, and a huge arm and hand which continued to scoop up the water. I simply looked at Jane and quietly mouthed, what the F? The thing then glanced at me, making direct eye contact before it rose up on two legs and headed back into the forest. Now, although it was big, it walked somewhat hunched over, and for some reason, I thought it was extremely old. It walked like a pensioner and seemed tired. We didn't alert the kids to this fact, but it instantly took the shine off the day. I wasn't scared in any way, but I couldn't figure out what I'd just seen. Was it some crazy mountain dude? A big guy in a suit? Whoever or whatever it was, it just didn't sit right. At this point, I said to the family that within the next 30 minutes, we should break camp and head back to the motorhome. As little as 15 minutes had passed when suddenly our two dogs went crazy. They are extremely good guard dogs, both very small but very brave pets. Suddenly, they were both facing the forest, barking like crazy, but for the first time in my life, they were backing up at the same time. All of us looked toward the forest, and my first thought was, that it could be a wild boar. We all tried to focus, when suddenly Eric shouted, Dad, over there! He was pointing to a relatively open section of the forest. Then I saw it. Big Red. 
Now, at this point, I could clearly see the size of the thing. It's important to note that I'm six foot two and my son is close to my height, but I know he'll be taller soon. We are both big guys, but from what I could gather, this thing was easily over seven feet tall. Both of us shouted in unison, and we instantly headed towards the thing that was watching us from afar while the girls hung back and tried to calm the dog. Whether this was fear or adrenaline kicking in, we both seemed to want to defend our pack and to confront whoever or whatever was stalking our camp from the forest. As we both scrambled up the rocks toward the forest, we could see it move back, retreating from our speedy approach. Jane shouted after us. I can't say what she said, to be honest. We were all heading through the trees, but now it seemed as if we were giving chase. I could see its red fur flash between the greenery as it took huge strides away from us. Jane called out something else from the edge of the lake. The dogs were still barking like crazy and were both starting to pant. We scrambled through another 100 meters or so of forest. I came to a halt and breathlessly I said to my son, I've lost track of it. As I tried to regain my breath, I caught sight of this giant face staring back at me with gray, aged features surrounded by mangy reddish fur. Its features appeared very much prehistoric. They were extremely ugly and big. It had also stopped, turned, and appeared in front of me, maybe three meters away at most. It stood there, looking directly into my eyes, breathing heavily with its huge nostrils opening and closing. Its fur-covered chest was rising in time with its massive inhalation. It was either out of breath or it had decided it was time to fight. I now suddenly felt fear. I no longer wanted to be there or have my family put at risk. I was staring at something very old, very wild, and a lot larger and heavier than me. I calmly told Eric to start backing away slowly, and he did exactly that while I maintained eye contact with the thing. I suddenly stumbled, which made me move quickly as I tried to regain my composure, which added to my fear. At this point, it seemed to almost grin at me, showing large but flat yellow teeth, very human-like in appearance, only much bigger. I felt like it was smirking at me, that it could sense my fear. I told Eric to turn and run when I thought that we were far enough away. So, we both ran until we made it back to base camp. I grabbed one of the spears the kids had made and told my family to move its speed. We quickly gathered our stuff, and with the dogs back on leashes, we made off. I constantly scanned the forest, fearing that it was coming after us. My heart was pounding. Eric was white in the face, but said nothing at all. Sonny was a little tearful and confused, while Jane bravely talked to us all as we scrambled back in the direction of civilization. Back in the safe haven of our campsite, I did, of course, discuss this at great length with Jane. We told Sonny it was just a mountain man and never mentioned it again in her presence. As far as Eric and I are concerned, it has somewhat changed our lives. We saw and experienced a human-like beast as far as we know has never ever been documented or mentioned. Is it a countryside secret? Do all or any of the locals know of its existence? Were the hunters actually looking for it rather than the wild boar? The questions go on and on, and we discuss this on a daily basis. My son has started internet research. We are unsure of our plans or direction right now. Do we tell? Do we go back? Do we forget it? I will say this, though. Just by writing this today, I feel as though a huge weight has been lifted from my shoulders. It's the first day since the encounter that I feel almost normal again and may be able to concentrate on my normal life. On to the next one. I was deer hunting on state ground that lies in the back of our cabin in Iron County in Michigan. 
It is a very rugged country with only a few foot trails that we keep open for access. The land is a mixture of high rock hills with very thick pine and hardwoods with dense swamps and small streams and creeks running through it. Along the river are the very thick tag alders which make the area outstanding for deer hunting. One evening, I was walking back to camp, which was approximately two miles away. I came around a bend in the trail and saw, about 50 yards in front of me, a silhouette of what looked like a very large man in the middle of the trail. The ground was covered with about six inches of snow, along with the trees, so I could only make out this dark silhouette very well. I thought it was one of my buddies, so I said fairly loud, so what did you see? Immediately, it turned and stepped across the trail and into the brush with no noise whatsoever. I stood there dumbfounded and scared for about five minutes before I worked up the courage to walk up the trail to where I had seen it, as this was the only way back to the cabin. I walked up to and past the spot where it was with my rifle leveled and the safety off, hoping not to see it again. I never did. It had just vanished without a sound. I hurried back to camp and never mentioned it to anyone. I went back the next day to look for any sign of anything, but about four inches of snow fell that night and I couldn't find anything. Over the years, I've played this over in my head and the only thing I can come up with is that for a brief instant, I was talking to a Bigfoot who didn't want to talk back. What I also noticed was that there was nothing no noises, no footprints, no breaking of brush. It just vanished. When I went back the next day, I stood where I had seen it and compared what I remembered of its height to the tree in front of it. And it was approximately seven to seven and a half feet tall, with shoulders approximately three and a half feet wide. I hunt there every year, and I have felt something's presence ever since. Whatever it was, it wasn't a bear, and it wasn't a man. The time was just after dusk as the woods were starting to get too dark to shoot, but I could see fairly well because of the snow. The area was higher ground, mostly pine and poplar in between swampy areas with tag alders, very thick. If there was ever a place for something like this to be, I guarantee you this is it. No one ever goes there but us. On to the next one. in Kingston in Tuscola County in Michigan. I am reporting this for a friend who witnessed the event. I was not in any way involved. My friend, Andy, left for work one morning. His first stop was to pick up his brother-in-law in Kingston. They work for the same county. He got to John's house, the brother-in-law, at about 5 a.m. in the Kingston area, a small farming community in Michigan's Thumb area. John owns a 20-acre farm, somewhat wooded itself, but surrounded by heavily wooded old forest. Anyway, when Andy got to John's house, it was still dark. He got out of the car and heard a scream come from the hayfield, but couldn't see anything. A minute later, he heard it again on the other side of the house, but this time he was at the door to the house. When John came out, there were no more screams. Andy, quite shaken, told John what he'd heard. John told him the night before, him and his wife were on the porch. After dark, he heard a scream coming from the hayfield. John went to investigate, but could see nothing, but heard the scream again, just out of sight. He walked toward the scream, but could not see anything. This went on for about an hour, but he never saw anything, so went back to the house. All night long, they heard screams around the house, but never real close to the house, and since then, it has not happened again. On to the next one. Near Flint in Janice County in Michigan, the witness was working in a fabrication shop that made modified parts for snowmobiles. The shop was located in an area that was virtually surrounded by endless miles of farmland. After finishing his shift, he decided to drive home with the top down of his convertible. 
as he came up to a long stretch of road he had to take in order to get home, he saw something crawling on all fours coming out of the culvert on the corner of the road. The creature was huge. It was about two quarters the size of his car, with what appeared to be black matted fur that almost looked like a shadow as it moved toward the house that was in the corner. It never dawned on the witness that he had completely stopped his car in order to look at the creature. As the witness stared at it, trying to make sense of what it was, it suddenly turned its head and looked at him. He then saw two almond-shaped blood-red eyes that seemed to illuminate out of the black void as they peered at him. The creature then turned away and slowly moved toward the back of the house, where it vanished. On to the next one. In Midland County, on Coleman Road, approximately six miles north of M20, near Coleman, I was driving north around 6.45 and saw a creature coming out of the ditch. Hair on the arms and head approximately eight inches hanging down. It was facing forward, then head turned when I was about ten feet away and it looked in my direction. The face was flat and ape-like. It was the opening day of gun deer season. On to the next one. As far back as ancient Rome, poet Virgil described in his book Aeneid, Book Six, how the great wild nature god Pan disported himself and caused panic among those who would capture him with his many monstrous guises, including wild beasts and demonic apparitions, wrote author Jim Branson in The Rebirth of Pan. Given the wild man's arch-typical roots in depictions of Pan, and other satyrs and fawns, it is no surprise they are. They, and by extension, Bigfoot, are ascribed transformative properties. A story from John Murray, a western Pennsylvania witness, who spotted a Bigfoot while racing all train vehicles with a friend. As they came around a bend, a huge, fur-covered monster crossed the trail, turning its head to look at them. They reached where the creature had entered the forest and decided to loop around, hoping to catch it as it exited the patch of woods on a parallel path. The maneuver took about five minutes. Ahead of us, leaning against a tree, was a man wearing nothing but a white t-shirt, blue jeans, and a pair of white canvas boat shoes with no socks, Murray said. It was early October and late in the day, with the temperature being in the upper forties and windy. The forest was damp, and the trails were somewhat loose and muddied from rain in the morning. Despite these conditions, the man appeared undisturbed by the chill, and his shoes were immaculate. As they stopped to greet him, Murray, overwhelmed by the odor of cheap aftershave and hair tonic, the man, who resembled a 1950s greaser character, denied having seen anything unusual and lit a cigarette which neither smelled nor burned down. He claimed to live nearby, but was otherwise not particularly talkative. Murray took his eyes off the man for just a moment, and he vanished, without leaving so much as a footprint. The pair were baffled and returned to the site of their initial sighting, where they failed to find any tracks, while the connection between the greaser and Bigfoot is more implied than overt in Murray's story. Other witnesses tell similar stories from radio journalist Dave Scott, who grew up on the lower mainland of British Columbia. This lake is called Davis Lake, and two fishermen got chased out of that lake by a Sasquatch in 2006, according to reports online. And we were out geocaching there one day, and my daughter looks over to the left side of the lake and probably 200 yards away from us, she watches this boy in swim trunks jump into the lake. There are no vehicles at this lake. You have to four by four in, like we had to ATV into this lake. There's one road in, one road out. There was no splash, and he never came up. And so my daughter was like, Dad, Dad, there was just somebody who jumped into the water off that big rock over there, and they haven't come up, and there was no splash. She was just like, I'm scared. Can we go? 
Like the Bigfoot greaser, there is nothing in the story to suggest that Bigfoot morphed into boys wearing swim trunks, but we must look at the company these phenomena keep. If everyone is to be believed, the least correlated scenario is that Bigfoot lurk around an area where there is a swimming ghost boy. Perhaps Bigfoot adopted the form of a swimmer. Stories of shape-shifting Bigfoot can be found worldwide. Antonio Blanco collected a 1978 case from Italy, of all places. A family traveling between Malazzo and Santa Lucia del Mela were passing an abandoned house when a bright light allegedly descended from the sky, stopping just above the ground to release a cloud of gray smoke. Out of the cloud came a naked, hairy being with sharp teeth and large, round eyes. As the beast bounded along the road, it transformed into a human being with long, brown hair, dressed in light-colored pants, and a dark jacket. This mystery cloud appears in other stories where Bigfoot changes appearance. In 2014, Anthony Padilla claimed to have seen a Sasquatch living on an ancient Indian burial ground on his Michigan property. Padilla told interviewers, I tried to speak to it, and I couldn't spit it out, and not that I wasn't scared, he wouldn't let me. He started getting like blurry, fuzzy, like a mist, like a spirit, like, and then I seen some antlers evolve, like they say they move like the ninja. That part is true. He turned around, bam, gave me a vision of white deer's tails and two hooves jumping away from me to try to make me forget what I'd seen. Wild men of both European folklore and late medieval culture possess a great number of fantastic or seemingly spiritual attributes, wrote University of Alberta anthropologist Gary Forth. Their strength is unearthly, and like spirits everywhere, they're able to change shape. This trend is shared with witches, ghosts, fairies, and demons, all of which, as illustrated elsewhere, have significant ties to the Bigfoot phenomenon. For example, a Mr. and Mrs. Lou Lister were sitting in a parked car near Point Isabel, Ohio, when they saw a Bigfoot change shape and vanish. The aforementioned propensity for alien black cats to appear in close temporal and geographical proximity to Bigfoot sightings, coupled with the frequency which creatures of myth and legend shapeshifted into panthers, begs the question whether or not these are actual felines being observed. In at least some cases, Bigfoot have been misidentified as panthers. During a highly localized 1979 Bigfoot flap in Bihalia, Mississippi, Residents opened fire on a large black cat stalking outside a chicken coop. Your uncle said when he went out there how it reminded him of a panther on its belly. That's kind of how they move when they're on all fours, podcaster Wes Germer told the primary witnesses. They move more like a cat when they're on all fours than they do, like a great ape or a monkey. They move more like a feline when they're on all fours. Either way, Bigfoot or ABC the creatures dropped several stolen eggs, implying hands. Some witnesses believe they have documented trackways that simply stop, leading some to wonder if Bigfoot may be interdimensional, whatever that means, or have the ability to shapeshift into another form, wrote the Oregon Bigfoot Group. Some witnesses have indicated that Bigfoot can turn into a rock or a stump or become invisible. It is unclear whether these reports are simply misidentifications of the creature's ability to camouflage themselves in their surroundings and hold very still. Native American stories of skinwalkers, which were shapeshifters, have been attributed to Sasquatch. A variety of Native American Bigfoot analogs, including the Tinglet Kustaka, are ascribed shape-shifting abilities as well. Some Kootenai elders claim Bigfoot can transform into wolves, while the Cherokee stone coat could assume human form or make itself invisible. Willie Charlie, a Chihalis tour guide, told the Toronto Star that Sasquatch is a salicum. These supernatural beings can shapeshift into anything. Sasquatch has the ability to walk the two realms, both physically and spiritually. Again, 
these beliefs may extend beyond the Americas. In India, the Rakshas of Hindu tradition are demon, often depicted as fanged, clawed, hairy man-eaters with flaming red eyes and the ability to assume any form. In fact, in an episode of the popular mid-1970s television show Kolchak the Night Stalker, featured a Rakshas that targeted its victim by taking the appearance of people they trusted most. In Australia's western desert, an unlucky person may have come across the path of a mamu, a cannibalistic humanoid that typically lives underground or in hollowed-out trees, wrote John B. Kuchuba, author of Shapeshifters, A History. It has a hairy body, bulbous eyes, and sharp, pointed teeth capable of stripping the flesh from its victim. It may appear human-like, or it may transform into a sharp-beaked bird, a dog, or even a falling star. In his 2008 book, The Hoopa Project, Bigfoot Encounters in California, researcher David Pallades spoke with numerous indigenous informants from Northern California who regularly saw not only Bigfoot, but also Kamoth, a snake-like creature that has the head the size of a horse and presumably eats river fish. During his investigations, Pallades began to suspect that given the creature's aforementioned affinity for swimming, while outright ignoring their physical description, Bigfoot might actually be mistaken for Kamoth. Pallades, of course, assumed simple misidentification that tribes were seeing a swimming hominid and ascribed it serpentine attribute. It is tempting, if unfounded, to speculate an alternative conclusion. Perhaps Bigfoot can shapeshift into river monsters. This possibility finds old-world precedent in the Scottish Kelpie, or water horse, which appeared as a water-dwelling horse monster, a beautiful lady, or a large man. In human form, the Kelpie is a rough, shaggy man who leaps behind a solitary rider, gripping and crushing him, wrote James McKillop in his Dictionary of Celtic Mythology. Some stories depict a human form Kelpie as tearing people apart and devouring them. Even flesh and blood hypothesis advocates believe Bigfoot has abilities shockingly close to shape shifting. To these research, Bigfoot are able to freeze so perfectly they blend in with the landscape, appearing as oversized stumps, logs, or trees. While this activity has certainly been explicitly observed during unambiguous Bigfoot sightings, it has also led to an entire subculture where Bigfoot is seen hiding in completely unremarkable photographs. In the thousands of sighting reports I have read, numerous witnesses stated that they saw a large black stump or a ball on a hillside. They looked at it momentarily, and after a few seconds, it started to move, wrote Pallades. This is a recurring theme in sighting reports. If you have encounters of your own you'd like to share, check out the description box below, where you'll find the email sstorysubmissions at gmail.com, where you can send in your submissions to be read on the channel. You can also send in your fan emails. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye! I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!